Welcome to our um, webinar that is hosted by the Embassy of Italy in Washington, D.C. and the Department of Communication Studies of the Ben Gurion University. I have the honor to bring the greetings of the Embassy of Italy in Washington, D.C. This seminar is very important to us as part of our um, digital diplomacy series. And without further ado, uh, I would leave the floor to our moderator, Ilaria Poggiolini, who will actually walk you through the program of today's webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, my welcome to, to the webinar on crafting the future of uh, cultural diplomacy in the digital era. Uh, this, uh, this webinar will be structured around the uh, four presentations, very brief presentations, uh, relatively brief presentations, with uh, immediately a reaction from me, from the chair, and then from opening to uh, questions from the audience. Uh, the audience is asked to, while you're listening and if you're stimulated by the presentations to write down in the chat, uh, your question possibly as concise as, uh, as you can. Um, uh, just a few more words before introducing the panelists. Uh, the idea of this webinar is to really bring together uh, different viewpoints. So bring together the scholarly theoretical side of the story, but also bring in practitioners uh, from diplomacy and the private sector. Uh, the, the main thing will be moving, actually, uh, our first speaker will actually move in that direction. So moving really beyond digital, meaning that uh, at the core of our webinar, we will have the metaverse, avatars, any uh, representations, <clears throat> I'm sorry, <clears throat> visual, visual representations uh, and, and the dimension of visuality in digital, uh, in digital diplomacy. Can this become part, active part of what uh, diplomats do, what are, which are the challenges, which are the risk, uh, which are the benefits. So all these questions in different ways would be answered and the experience of uh, studying or practicing uh, the, new, uh, the new frontiers of uh, digital diplomacy would be uh, coming in into the various uh, presentations. So without further ado, I will present one, um, one um, uh, speaker at the time. And the first one is uh, Cornelio Zola, who is Professor of Diplomatic Studies at the University of Oxford. And he's, uh, we've been collaborating before at different levels uh, in events and in teaching. Uh, I very much appreciate his, uh, his now long-term experience in uh, studying, researching, and writing about themes related to digital diplomacy. And in this case, he will try to go, this is, this is the subject of his presentation, go beyond digital and focus on the storytelling in uh, cultural diplomacy and the, how the new tools will allow uh, storytelling to reach different uh, levels. So without further ado, I will pass, give the floor to uh, Cornelio Giola. Thank you very much, Ilaria, for the kind introduction, um, and also to the Embassy of Italy in, uh, in Washington, in the United States, and to the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs for, for facilitating and organizing this event. I mean, my my uh, short presentation, I think it's it's great to be here, and uh, it will be even better, you know, to be in the metaverse to have this meeting, and maybe, who knows, you know, next year we'll be able to do this, especially since Allegra is preparing some surprises for us about which you may, may talk a bit later. But what I like to, to uh, cover in my short presentation, it's, it's a critical question, which I think it's, it's becoming even more important nowadays, is um, to what extent you know, the metaverse uh, is likely to disrupt um, you know, cultural diplomacy, the way in which cultural diplomacy is being conducted? And if so, how exactly? And I think the question deserves attention in light of the recent surge of public interest in the concept of the metaverse, right? Surrounding the metaverse, particularly since uh, October 2021, 20, right? When Zuckerberg made his announcement and then he rebranded Facebook as a meta company and the effort he has made and the money he invested in making this kind of uh, a turn. 
Uh, but at the same time, I think we have to be careful, careful not uh, to exaggerate the potential impact, uh, but also, you know, not to underestimate the potential, uh, the significance of this technology for cultural diplomacy in particular and digital diplomacy more broadly. So my answer to this, I think it's it's a balanced one, it's a measured one. I think there are opportunities for, for the metaverse to change um, uh, uh, cultural diplomacy and the strongest potential is uh, Ilaria hinted in the storytelling. More specifically, the strongest potential I see, I anticipate for uh, the metaverse, uh, comparing for instance with social media, it's at the level of interaction, interaction between audiences as well as between those creators of culture and disseminator of culture. So um, I, I, I like to, to discuss this um, and to explain a little bit what I mean by this. In order to do this, you know, just very briefly to explain a little bit the terms. So what exactly we mean by, by metaverse here? Metaverse, of course, you know, represents as we move forward, you know, this kind of network. It's a network of three dimensional virtual worlds. And the most uh, one that we see nowadays is the Meta Horizon world, but there are many others, Decentraland, Sandbox, Roblox, uh, Infinity, and others, which are not necessarily all uh, accessible through a VR headset, but nevertheless, they, they, they involve a particular way in which uh, our digital art egos, avatars, are used to interact um, uh, with others, you know, for um, accomplishing certain political, economic, or uh, doing certain political, economic, or cultural activities. So in a sense, we can think about the metaverse as an extension of the physical reality, in which various users, via their digital uh, ego, alter ego, the avatars can experience these worlds at the same time. So with that in mind, in what sense then, you know, the metaverse can interfere with the way in which Ministry of Foreign Affairs, cultural institutes or embassies, you know, uh, engage in cultural diplomacy. I think we have to step back and remember what cultural diplomacy is about. It's about, in a sense, you know, creating an environment in which foreign audiences may connect, right, with the type of, um, uh, artifacts and, and uh, um, uh, cultural resources that embassies make available to them. These this artifacts or these cultural resources vary, of course. You have festivals, you have art galleries, we have performing acts, many other things. But what is important to remember in the case of cultural diplomacy, as it has been done before the rise of social media and then after the rise of social media, is that in in general terms, culture is presented to the audience, is not experienced, is not lived, right? So you interact, but in a very passive way. So I think that's the, the, the angle, the entry point for the metaverse in which, you know, the VR can actually change the audience from a passive spectator um, to, you know, the type of cultural uh, elements that are presented to them to becoming more engaged from spectators to spect actors. It's a term that has come up, you know, recently in, in a number of articles. So in this case, you interact, but you also experience, uh, you leave the culture. So in what sense VR can do this? I think there are three elements that VR brings to the table. The first one is a sense of presence. What is presence? It's a concept that has emerged in VR, the VR literature. It's a mental state in which the user feels physically present in that computer mediated environment. And that depends a lot on the quality of the headset and so on. Um, uh, there is also the question of, uh, I think, you know, important to remember the agency. This is an important aspect. Spectators don't have agency when they a look at cultural uh, resources. A VR brings in principle an idea of agency, ability to navigate in the space, interact with objects, engage with artificial intelligence narrators or even other avatars. And another uh, element, the third element that I want to highlight is the possibility of adopting different perspectives. Third person perspective frames the audience as a spectator, but first person uh, perspective introduces the, the, the audience as an actor. So the interesting aspect in VR is how to combine first person perspective with third person perspective. And I think these three elements contribute to creating this kind of different experience that for audiences. So let me highlight uh, three examples if I can uh, share the screen with you. Uh, three examples uh, um, uh, here. Um, 
So the first one uh, that I want to mention is an application in VR is called R-Plunge. It's still a demo, but what is interesting about it, it highlights different this kind of famous painting, the Mona Lisa or the girl were reading a letter by the window by Vermeer. So what makes this kind of, of, of paintings interesting or the application is that instead of a 2D, the way in which we look at the painting nowadays, you enter the frame. You enter the frame basically, and then you can see the character reading the, uh, the letter. You can listen to the street noise. You actually experience the era the, uh, 300 years ago and the, the movement, what it happens. So our plan is a very interesting one. There is a lot of presence. Agency is a bit limited because you can hear what is going on, but you cannot interact, for instance, with the character. Uh, you just look at it, you know, experience. And the perspective is one of a, uh, of a third person. So I think it's a, one uh, way in which this kind of culture is experienced using this kind of famous uh, artifact. The Anna Frank House is another interesting one because it's a replica of the annex, the annex in which Anna Frank with her family and the other companions hide during World War II to avoid um, uh, persecution in Amsterdam. It's a very detailed, realistic um, uh, image of various rooms. Um, there is a lot of presence. You feel there. You feel there. If you visited the place before in Amsterdam, the physical one, you really feel that you are there. There is a lot of agency. You can move. You can interact. You can touch the diary. You can do a lot of other things that you can move. Uh, you, for instance, you can listen to BBC. There is a radio. You can listen to the BBC and hear, you know, the sound of the, you know, the announcement about the the, uh, the landing day, you know, the D-Day in Normandy. And also the perspective, because the perspective is done through the eyes of Anna Frank, the fear, the hope that she had experienced at that time. So it's a very immersive perspective. And again, you know, uh, you can experience that in various ways. A third example that I wanted to uh, mention is the key. The key is a, a, it's a theatrical performance. It's a movie that got a number of awards uh, for, for VR for good. It's a very interesting one because in this case, it's, it's not realistic. It's about abstract, but there is a lot of presence. I don't want to disclose the outcome because it's like a movie, like a theater. You don't want to, uh, uh, it's based on the idea that you don't uh, uh, know uh, what is going on. But there is a lot of presence. You feel that, you feel it's a, a lot of emotional framing involved. Uh, and also agency, because one element that they try to teach people is how to experience the loss of a person which is quite difficult and they think they do it quite well. And also the perspective they do it here, it oscillates between first person perspective to third as a spectator and an actor. So that kind of combination I think is done much better for instance, comparing with the previous two examples. So just to conclude here, I think uh, the, the point here about the VR in, in culture is that, uh, you know, um, these are few examples that they made. The sky is the limit. You can experience Rome during the time of Julius Caesar or London during the Great Fire of 1666, or, you know, uh, for the cruelty of colonialism uh, uh, um, in this sense. But the larger point here about VR, it can transform the way in which audiences interact. Uh, interact with the cultural artifact, right? It's not only about being passive, but also experiencing in a way that it was not possible on social media or in a traditional way. So I think that's um, the, the advantage probably. And I'm going to stop here because time is very short. So um, yeah. thank you very much. Unfortunately, yeah, very short, but thank you so much for at least, you know, bringing to the table in the first, uh, in the first presentation, the question of participation. So is that is that the crucial new uh, new frontier of uh, cultural diplomacy? We will discuss it uh, after the first round. So let me just move uh, as uh, time is precious to our second uh, speaker, who is uh, Councilor Alega Baistrocki, uh, who is a consul in Detroit, Italian consul in Detroit, and she will. Uh, tell us about her own uh, experience with a project called Love uh, IT Detroit, the Metaverse, which has been uh, uh, which has been launched with the, the the world first free exhibition of modern Italian art in collaboration with the uh, Museum of, of Contemporary Modern Art in uh, in Rome, and of course with a large 
uh, uh, interaction with the private sector, which we will hear about after her presentation or during her presentation as well, because one, one key, uh, key element of our discussion is to see how the public and private sector are interacting in constructing um, this in engaging in the new um, uh, in the new frontier of, of uh, digital diplomacy. So Allegra, the uh, floor is yours. That's it. I'm going to start by sharing my screen immediately so we can get started. I have a lot to say. I need to thank, obviously, uh, our embassy in Washington and the Ben Gurion University of the Negev for organizing this. I feel very humbled and proud to be part of this panel um, amongst a much more learned people in, in this field, and I'm hoping to learn from this as well as give a small presentation of what we did. Uh, as Ilaria said, I am the Consul of Italy in Detroit. I'm in charge of five states, Michigan, Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana, and Tennessee. And uh, if, as most of you probably know, a consulate's sort of two key tasks are on the one side, prov providing services, so passports, the visas, the consular assistance, but on the other hand, it's also about promotion. So in my case, the promotion of Italian language, culture, and commerce. Um, obviously, the second part is a little bit more exciting, and I have to say I'm very fortunate because Italy is a very easy uh, country to promote. I arrived in Detroit in September of 2021, and I found a... Um, a great city, very vibrant, artistically speaking as well. I found it uh, 20,000 Italians uh, in my jurisdiction, but I also found two and a half million Americans of Italian descent who are incredibly nation proud, love Italy, celebrate what is traditional Italy. So the food, the wine, the travel destination, the churches and, and, and the museums, um, but a little bit less inclined on all the what is contemporary Italy so technologically advanced and innovative um, and so when I would you know talk to people and say do you equate Italy with space they would look at me literally as if I was an alien so I wanted to change the narrative and that's the starting point of love at Detroit I wanted to use cultural diplomacy to show people rather than preach at people um, Detroit is the only uh, UNESCO city of design in the United States and I, so I decided to use design as my vehicle to to promote a contemporary Italy. So we decided to create Love of Detroit. You'll see here there is a digital representation of where we started. Um, and we ended up with a one month long installation that everybody could view for free in our physical space in downtown Detroit, uh, which had 60 brands, 100 products. And then we had 112 uh, in-person speakers, as I said, Italy in space. So we had a Martian drone landing simulation. We had a VR uh, car race. We had a number of, of highly advanced things in our actual events. But then I said, I would like to have a metaverse. And I'm very fortunate because we do, which is an Italian company that also has a headquarter here in Detroit. And Franco Bivione, you will hear, who is a US CEO, will speak about it more specifically. Um, I went to WeDo and I said, can we do something? And they said, absolutely, yes, let's get a metaverse going. And um, to our knowledge, we we're the first public entity to have a metaverse. And you're seeing here a video of how one would start, you know, choose what one looks like, choose the clothing, create their avatar, and then be able to enter the space. The reason for wanting a metaverse in the first place is twofold. On the one hand, I wanted to have maximum inclusivity. So in our physical space, we got rid of all elevation. We had ramps. It was all very accessible. Uh, but then we had the metaverse because I wanted to really create uh, no barriers, even geographically. And we had people from all over the world that came to uh, to see our metaverse. And this is what you're seeing now was our, was our metaverse 1.0, which was all about made in Italy and design. Um, you could come in, you could interact with the objects. This is just a brief video that would show you, you know, a bit of the layout. It was not a perfect digital twin because we had a lot more things in in, in the real life, but it is a good enough example. So we had about 10,000 people in our metaverse in September. We had 2,000 visitors in our installation. We had over 1,000 people um, at our events. Uh, we, we, we linked with, uh, with social media. We had reels that were over 60,000 views. Uh, we got the Spirit of Detroit Award, which was the maximum sort of recognition of the city for this endeavor. And so then we decided to do our 2.0 
um, metaverse because in October we have La Giornata del Contemporaneo, so Contemporary Art Day. And instead of doing a exhibit that I thought, you know, we can have, uh, you know, an art show in Detroit, again, you know, it, it'll be limited in amount of people that can go to it. Let's have it once again, since we had the infrastructure for our metaverse, I thought that um, we could uh, team up with La Galleria Nazionale d'Arte Moderna, which is the biggest museum in Italy for modern and contemporary art. We wanted to celebrate the first year of the Be It campaign, um, which is you know, our first nation branding campaign that Italy has. And so we kept the infrastructure of our Metaverse 1.0 and made it into an art gallery. Um, and as you will see, as, as we took this video, there are actually other people in this video as well that were actually people that were live looking at the paintings while, whilst we were filming it. It goes in a sort of, um, there is a, obviously the, our Ministry of Foreign Affairs is very uh, attentive to digitalization. It's part of our PNRR, the, the recovery program post COVID. Our embassy of, of Italy in Washington clearly is paying a lot of attention to it. Not only are they, you know, sponsoring this webinar. They've also, you know, created a whole digital diplomacy series. They also allowed us uh, consoles. They gave us consoles for the first time, a social media management course, which we'd never had before. So for us, it was, you know, we are approaching this world, but we're not experts, but we find ourselves in trying to have to use these tools. Um, and so that was what it was. We are doing it all again. The reason why the metaverse isn't active right now is it's under construction. Um, our plan is to have a new metaverse in September when we do Love in Detroit once again. Our underlying theme for this year, I can already say is sustainability. Uh, I use um, our tools to tell stories. So just like I did with space for 2023, I want to talk about sustainability. It allows me to talk about all those things that Italy isn't known for. We are the first country in Europe for recycling of waste. We have the best efficiency use of resources. All these things that here are lesser known. So I'm trying to change the narrative. I'm somewhat succeeding in this. And I'm gonna just, since we're talking about digital diplomacy, I'm gonna put up our information there. So if anybody wants to follow us and know more, we'll have more information coming soon. So that's in a nutshell, I was very brief. <laughs> Thank you, Allegra. No, that's perfect. That's perfect has a first uh, uh, presentation. Uh, I think it's uh, what is wonderful is that you both, both you and, and Cornelia have been hitting on the, the, the question of, of uh, being active, uh, how these tools allow you, 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 you talked about inclusivity, while, you know, Cornelio was talking about uh, uh, moving from active to, to, from passive to active, and we will go back to that. Uh, it would be great now to hear how this project in Detroit, yeah, we saw a cooperation between uh, uh, public and uh, private, and uh, this is actually at the core of any development in the future of the metaverse, as we perhaps will go back on that with a couple of questions. And uh, so I would like to, uh, to ask Franco Bivione, who is the CEO of a company called We Do, uh, W-E-D-O-O-L-L-C, uh, -E uh, which has been very, very actively collaborating on this project. We would love to hear you, your voice. So the uh, floor is yours, Franco. Thank you, Laria. And thanks again to all the institutions, the embassy, the consulate, uh, the ministry, and the University of Ben Gurion to, to have me here today. I'm very proud. I'm very humble too with all those experts around me. So let me bring uh, my, as I said, humble experience uh, that I made around uh, the processes of cultural diplomacy that I followed from, I would say, my 26, 27 years of career. So let me uh, jump uh, uh, back because Allegra already showed you what we have done recently. And I would like to do a jump back many years before. I'm talking about uh, 9, 000, uh, 9, um, sorry, 1958 uh, in uh, Brussels, uh, when there was an expo, uh, the Universal International Trade Fair. As you know, the expo is uh, uh, one of the instruments that countries uh, uh, and institution organization have used during time to present the best of breed of what they had in terms of technology, uh, art, uh, and culture. Uh, at the expo, uh, well, probably who has been in Brussels remember the atomium. The atomium is the symbol of Brussels uh, and is the only element that still remains of that uh, international exhibition of uh, 65 years ago. 
Um, there were many others presented by different countries. The Atomium was one of them. And there was one in particular that I want to focus the attention on. It was a pavilion created by Philips, the company that we all know. Philips wanted to present in 1958 the best of breed of what they had in terms of technology capacity uh, to propose to the world. And uh, why I'm, I'm bringing that up? Because uh, three very important uh, uh, characters, uh, artists uh, uh, of that time, Le Corbusier that I think doesn't need any kind of introduction, one of the most important architects in the world, Varese that I frankly didn't know before that, uh, he was a music composer um, representative of the avant-garde, uh, with very weird concept and aesthetic, uh, he was thinking that every kind of noise, every kind of vibration in our life can become music if organized in a certain way. Uh, and then uh, Yanis Xanakis, uh, that was at the time an assistant of uh, Le Corbusier, but was again a multi-faceted uh, 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 artist, uh, engineer, architect, composer. Together, they worked for Philips to create uh, what uh, is called today Le Poème Electronique, the electronic poem, that was a real installation. You see here a real picture of that time, uh, made in 1958. Two million people visited this space. And why I think it's so important for what we're talking about today? Because in this space, there was what is considered the first multimedia event installation uh, in history, 65 years ago, imagine at the time. And uh, even the structure that was uh, is called a um, hyperbolic paraboloid, it was something extremely innovative. Uh, it was made by asbestos and concrete. I saw the video where the workers are spreading asbestos on these surfaces. It's really an incredible time. Anyway, inside this structure, they created um, a eight, nine minutes show with lights, sound, um, video, uh, and uh, an experience in general where the users uh, were seeing all the best of technology. Just to give you an idea, uh, Xanakis was able to put 350 speakers that were working together to create incredible sound effects composed by, by Varese and, uh, and all directed by Le Corbusier. Um, just to give you an idea, I'm not going to show you all the video, but uh, I like to see those images because they are really from another time, but are still very... Let me take off completely the audio. Here you see some images of what it was and some images of what we made a year after. Um, wh why is it important? Because all this that you're seeing was completely lost. For 50 years, uh, Pieces of this installation were conserved in different places, saved in Getty Museum, Getty Foundation in Los Angeles, uh, uh, Le Corbusier Foundation, in other places. Were studied from different single point of view, but never all together like it was in 1958. What we did in um, years after, putting together, um, let me go, let me go next. Um, what we did almost 50 years after was to put together a team of uh, companies, private and uh, public institution under the umbrella of the Culture 2000 program supported by the, the European community. And at the time, I was the director of the Virtual Reality and Multimedia Park and Innovation Research Center, where Professor Vincenzo Lombardo was working with us and the university to recreate this. And uh, we had partners around Europe, University of Bath in UK, uh, the University of Berlin in Germany, uh, the other Polytechnic in, in Poland. And uh, together, we recreated, uh, collecting all the information from all these different sources, we recreated in virtual reality an immersive application where it was possible to live again the experience. It was 2005. So imagine that technology was pretty different from what we have today. But it was, in terms of concept, the same thing that Allegra was showing before that we did today with, uh, with uh, Lovey Detroit and, uh, and the different installation. Um, we recreated the, 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 the space, the 3D geometry of the space. We recreated all the experience, starting from document, partly incomplete about the composition made by Varese, by the different document to save the, the original recording of the sound made by Varese in, in different moments. And 
we have created something that here in really a few seconds I try to show you in like at a glimpse where the structure as it was became a 3D application um, immersive that can be used by different these are the original document we started working with and uh, it became something alive again why I started from that and I like very much what Cornelius was saying at the beginning that uh, I really witnessed uh, in these 30 years uh, I work with museums mm, a lot of times and museums are one of the example of instrument of cultural diplomacy uh, put in place by states uh, government and so on uh, very I wanted to show this because this guy almost 80 years old he he was there in 1958 he retried the experience uh, and he was very as you see very he enjoyed it he said yes yeah, it was very close to the even better than the real one but uh, that's okay now let me um get back to what I was saying I like very much what Cornelius was saying because I saw in these 30 years a big change between what um the classic communication from museum was that was a sort of top-down approach where you were going to a museum I remember I was young the teacher was telling you stay silent just look at what they're saying you, you you cannot interact so it was a sort of authoritative message given by a government an institution or or somebody to the users I saw all these changes a long time where to were also at a certain time there was a sort of risk that uh, the 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 message was losing power because uh, the power was going into the hands of the users and that's what happened for example with the news in the news world with the advent of social media and interaction today all of us we don't know if the source is really trustable like it was before or not but I think it's a um, a passage that we have to absolutely to to follow and to support uh I want to close here because I think I'm already 30 seconds uh, late probably right Alaria? yes and, more uh, or less. but I can also use the future during the Q&A session because I have another application yeah. that I wanted to show you that is today but maybe if there are questions I can open it up and show you during the the rest of the absolutely we will we will come back to you and uh thank you for giving us you know direct uh, uh experience of how you over time actually saw your role uh in uh, in supporting um uh cultural diplomacy by you know for example in the in the case that you have just showed us um i would like to finish the, the first round of uh, presentations first before uh making some comments and also taking on uh, if I can, some of the comments which are already in the chat. Um, so our our fourth speaker is uh, we started with the scholar, scholarly views, scholarly views, and we end with scholarly views. Uh, Ilan Manor, who is uh, um, uh, who's been very much actually behind this initiative, this webinar in particular, uh, and uh, who is uh, a lecturer at the uh, University of the Ben Gurion. Uh, University of the Negev, but he's also been working as another scholar who's been extraordinarily active in the, in the publishing and also interacting with various projects, including in Oxford with uh, Cornelio uh, on public diplomacy and on digitalization of public diplomacy. So uh, I think it would be very good to round up the uh, the panel with your uh, with your presentation, which is also focusing on on aspects related to the cultural institutes, so the global cultural institutes and the pra new practice of, of cultural diplomacy within that sphere. So Ilan, the uh, floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Ilaria, and uh, a big thank you to the uh, Italian Embassy in the US for uh, co-hosting this wonderful event with us at the University of Ben Gurion. I'll, uh, I'll uh, share my screen uh, also from the beginning so that uh, we don't have to, oh, no, sorry, yes. So uh, as I said, my name is Ilan Manor and I'm a senior lecturer at the, the Department of Communications at Ben Gurion University. And what I thought I could talk about in the next five minutes is to broaden the discussion a little bit beyond the metaverse and also maybe beyond the nation state and talk about cultural relations institutions. So here I am talking about institutes such as the British Council, or the German Goethe Institute. And these are state uh, institutions that are tasked with managing cultural diplomacy 
on the global scale. Uh, British Council has uh, tens or even dozens of uh, uh, institutions spread out across the world. The same with the Goethe Institute, uh, the French have their institutions, etc. And what's interesting is that cultural institutes have recently undergone an accelerated process of digitalization and using digital technologies. And there are really four reasons for it. First, the stakeholders and publics that they interact with increasingly use digital technologies. Some of these institutes believe that digital is a new way for reaching new publics and new audiences, and they also regard digital activities as being more cost effective than offline activities. But perhaps most important is the lingering effect of the COVID-19 pandemic, as more and more people across the world became accustomed to consuming culture from their home using digital devices. But what's interesting is that when we look at cultural institutions, this is a relatively new process. So in other words, these institutes lag behind other government agencies and ministries. And about a year ago, the British Council decided to commission a think piece in order to answer two questions. How to practice digital cultural diplomacy and how to do so on a global scale. And I was lucky enough to be one of the scholars that they invited to answer these questions. And I wanted to share with you three of the arguments that we made to the British Council about global cultural diplomacy. And the first really touches on the concept of hybridity. And hybridity is a digital approach that seeks to blend physical and digital activity. Hybridity actually tries to recognize when digital technologies offer an added value, but also when they do not. So for instance, if we're talking about attending a, a ballet, most people would prefer to attend a ballet physically and not necessarily through Zoom. Some people might even say that Zoom dilutes the experience of going to a ballet, which is much more enriching if you sit in, a, in an audience in a beautiful hall. But a lecture series can definitely benefit from digital technologies, as instead of a physical lecture series, you could have a digital one. The same is true of using WhatsApp groups to manage a global network of teachers. So hybridity really, oh, sorry, one second. So hybridity is not about making a choice between physical and digital activities, but hybridity is about asking if and when digital technologies can best complement or augment physical cultural activities. The second thing that we explained to the British Council was that digital technologies do not merely create channels for communication, but they create entire digital environments that are governed by certain logics and norms. So what do I mean? The digital environment of social media is governed by the logic of reciprocal following. I follow you and you follow me in return. And also of two-way interactions, of conversation. That's not necessarily true of Zoom, which it, that's not necessarily true of Zoom, which is a different digital environment where the logic is usually limited dialogue. We also know that a lot of time when people participate in Zoom conversations, they are multitasking. There's even the phenomenon now called Zoom fatigue. At about 45 minutes, an hour into a Zoom conversation, people begin to Zoom out. So digital cultural activities have to be tailored to the logic of digital environments. You cannot really successfully use Zoom for two-way discussions or for a two-hour discussion because it's governed by the logic of limited dialogue and multitasking. Yeah. But in the same way, you can't use social media for one-way information dissemination because people on social media expect two-way interactions. They expect conversation. So what we tried to tell the British Council was that the concept of tailoring is crucial for global cultural diplomacy. That's tailoring between your goal, your cultural activity, and the digital environment. Finally, we advocated that global cultural institutions think locally. And what do I mean locally? Well, imagine that these institutions want to promote a cultural activity across the world. This goal has to be translated into local digital infrastructures. In other words, what I'm saying is that different technologies are employed in different countries in different ways. So if you want to promote an arts festival in India, this might best be achieved through a WhatsApp group, but the same festival may best be promoted in France using Facebook. So global thinking really leads cultural institutions to consider important digital factors, such as local digital infrastructure, local digital literacy rates, and even locally available digital devices. 
And I think that global thinking also recognized that when we're talking about cultural diplomacy and especially digital cultural diplomacy, there is no one size fits all solutions. Different nations can accommodate different forms of digital cultural activity. So what are the main conclusions of this short presentation and the report that was commissioned to the British uh, Council? Well, first of all, we know that digital technologies are increasingly used in global cultural diplomacy. But it's important to remember that the offline and online world are not separate spheres. These are two worlds that intersect and impact one another all the time. For instance, an embassy can host a physical workshop for artists, but then use LinkedIn to turn this into a vibrant community online. And I think that what we realize is that the future of digital cultural diplomacy is blended. It will rest on a mix between online and offline activities, offline activities that are then continued online, or online activities that are used in order to leverage future offline activities. Uh, I think I'll stop here because that's my five minutes, but uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Ilan. And actually, you gave me a chance to, to uh, um, play this ball back to the entire, to the entire um, um, panel, uh, meaning uh, if uh, the idea of an hybrid uh, new normal, say an hybrid new normal in cultural diplomacy may be the future. And uh, uh, if that is true, how do we combine that with the debate on uh, new realities, or say, you know, with the metaverse, uh, which is which tends to um, uh, to to create a reality which is very similar to the to the uh, original one. So, is it possible to have an hybrid when there is a tendency of the metaverse, if embraced, to become the reality? Um, is that kind of an absolute? Uh, that is difficult to share, that is difficult to make hybrid. Uh, first of all, I would like to ask uh, Corneli if he wants to add something on this level of the discussion. I mean, how absolute is the metaverse in, in, in a perspective? Not now, perhaps, but in a perspective. Is that, is that possibly, a, is it a possibility to follow uh, what Ilana just said? So, you know, to settle down for an hybrid uh, dimension once you know no new visual representations come into the picture what do you think yeah so i started my, my inquiry at the beginning you know with trying to understand what are the areas that in which you know um uh, the metaverse could be most disruptive and the areas in which could be least the least disruptive and i think the least disruptive part is accessibility but why is that because at the moment you know the cost of creating i don't know allegra how much it will cost or uh, franco how to create this kind is not something that many Ministry of Foreign Affairs can afford. Uh, um, there's so it requires talent, it requires people, you know, and also on the user side, you know, the cost of a headset, it's around 300 pounds, uh, even more $400. So in terms of accessibility, this remains, continues to remain a niche, a niche which uh, uh, may, may evolve. So there is a problem for accessibility. But at the same time, I think, you know, in terms of those who are quite interested in promoting, you know, certain areas, uh, Allegra mentioned several things, you know, which uh, countries want to brand themselves, right? Not only to get stuck into the past, but also to present themselves as, you know, uh, what is important about, about the future, how to like to be seen. And I think uh, uh, this kind of digital technologies allows you to do this. How to combine the, the hybridity here, I think, is uh, is clear, uh, and I'm uh, surprised, you know, uh, pleasantly about the numbers that Allegra presented, that you have about 10,000 visitors, but, you know, the impact on social media was 6,000, uh, you know, in terms of shares and likes. And that's a good example, right, in which you, you integrate, you know, certain type of events that are accessible to a few, but nevertheless quite productive. At the same time, you create a story that can actually travel quite well online. So it's not either or, I think it's a combination of both. Um, there are areas in which uh, the metaverse could be quite uh, important, you know, um, to, to, to pursue. Um, uh, but at the same time, let's not forget about the fact that, you know, this is not a replacement. It's about integration. I think that's, that's I think, is the key message here, probably. 
Okay, so integrating, I mean, in, as in the past with digital diplomacy at all different stages, we have been actually uh, at, at, very, at first uh, worried about, you know, the old style uh, uh, getting out of the picture and a new one taking hold, but actually it is a, a, a combination. It's, it has created a new combination, new possibilities to, to blend the new and the old. But... Yeah. If and, I and, to... and again, I mean, the Franco, I think, you know, with his example, yeah. you know, it would be interesting to see, you know, how how he pursues, you know, how, how what, what, uh, what kind of audience he has in mind, you know, in order yes. to absorb, you know, that. that Indeed, Franco. we will go back to that as well. Uh, just taking on also some of the questions which have been put by the audience. I'd like to ask Allegra, because there, there's been a lot of, uh, and I'm curious myself, um, how do you measure uh, the impact of uh, uh, your promotion of um, uh, a modern uh, face of Italy. Uh, I know myself how difficult it is to go that path, uh, even in education, when we try to explain uh, the Italian universities are not what uh, uh, many think they are. Uh, so how do you change the perspective? And has it been successful? Some of people in the audience wants to know if you've been able to measure the success of your, of your initiative yeah, from that well point of view. Let's say success is difficult. What I, what I like is statistics. So to have had, That's you know, what I mean, I mean, success in that sense, sorry. 26,000 okay. people on our metaverse uh, in its two different iterations. We had 10,000 in September and over 16,000 in, in November when we did our art exhibition. So 26,000 people connected from you know, mainly Detroit and Michigan and my five states, because that's where I was actively promoting it. But obviously from Italy and we had people from Japan and from Africa, it was it was incredible to see it in that sort of sense. Ilan mentioned like the dilution of the experience. I got asked in an interview um, by a student actually of the Sole 24 management course on um, conservation of, of, of cultural art. Um, and she said, is it not diluting the experience by having an art exhibit in the metaverse? And I said, well, no, because if you cannot be in Rome to see this art in person, this is the next best thing. And in some ways, it is it a better thing? You can arrive to a level of, of detail, like the example also that Cornelio brought, of getting into like, within you know one centimeter of a piece of art which you wouldn't be able to do in in in, in the metaverse clearly um as as far as other indicators go we had 30 articles in the u.s press i don't know if you guys know american media they do not care about anything that's not american so clearly the fact that they would write about something that a consulate does was sort of unheard of and it was both local and national so i was very proud of that um in terms of business uh we had incredible networking with each event that we had in person, there was, you know, business people from that sector that were both local and from Italian companies and from other countries. Um, and to be honest, like, you know, I've had, you know, companies come back to me and say, grazie Ligra for your introduction. I've had so-and-so a contract. So it, it could be also, you know, recognized in monetary terms. Obviously, I don't have access to that. Um, but what I'm hoping to do for this coming year, for September, is um, there is an incredible media publication called We the Italians that sort of promotes all things that Italy does in America. Um, and they have come up with a sort of, um, I'm not sure who they partnered up with, but they came up with an analytics that sort of is a um, uh, represent, like they, they measure the perception change. So I, this is since it is something that I absolutely am interested in doing. I've, I'm, we're working on them for September to see from start to finish of the month, and they will they will do their analytics and sort of give me some feedback on the actual impact of our event for this year. So that's exciting. Excellent. Great, Allegra. That's very good to hear. I mean, of course, this will open a, uh, a reflection for us also academics to do how to understand how, how slow or how quick is the perception of a country, um, the change in the perception of a country uh, is, you know, how long it takes and uh, what kind of, you know, you're using your tools you, in, in your professional capacity. Uh, it's also would be interesting to see how sociologically uh, this has an impact on the mentality. That's why it's, it's a longer term 
long-term uh, reflection. Uh, I would also ask, I'd like to ask uh, um, uh, Franco to perhaps give us a little bit more, if, can I, if I can be really blunt uh, and ask a question maybe that also is interesting for the audience. I mean, what is in all this? for the private sector. I know that you clearly are passionate about this and your story about the Brussels uh, project shows that. But if you brutally had to answer a question, what is what do you think that not just for you, but for the private sector embarking in these experiences? What, what, is, what are the most, uh, 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 what are the benefits? Uh, yeah. Yeah, let me let me say, uh, first of all, that uh, um, I show you something connected to the culture environment, but uh, we exploit all the things we do very much in the private industry. So, for example, we do comes from more than 20 years of experience in using the technologies that I was showing you before applied many years ago in any case, but uh, we use them for current applications, for example, at the moment we're working on a virtual dealership for selling cars where a potential buyer on a website is choosing all the colors all the options he wants on his new car but at the end of the process instead of going to the dealership that is a process by the way that i understood all over the world nobody likes very much uh, they can get into a metaverse uh, like uh, uh, space that is a sort of virtual dealership they can talk they can chat with uh, a dealer representative talk about finance talk about everything till to finalizing the contract also amazon is experiencing these kind of things so that just to say that the private sector has a lot of interest for this kind of technologies and then we just apply them to to the culture world to the culture diplomacy world um just to give you an example that i i couldn't do before if i can still a couple of minutes uh, uh, before my application didn't load up, so I, I, I did in the in the meanwhile. Uh, let me share my screen and uh, I integrate uh, uh, the answer I was giving you, Ilaria. Can you see my screen now? Yeah. No, actually, no. Not yet. What about now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I wanted to show you this. That is a, a sort of. Uh, uh, higher level of what we've been able to to create with Allegra. What you've seen with uh, Lovey Detroit was the peak of the iceberg, and we did that obviously for uh, with Allegra knows that very well with a lot of budget constraints, time constraints. Uh, obviously, we we couldn't do whatever was possible in that case. But today, with the technologies coming from the um, video game world, where we are talking about multi-billion with a B dollars company. Uh, there are a lot of capacity that we can put in place. What I'm showing you here, for example, is uh, uh, a new tool that is free. We are collaborating with them. Uh, Epic, uh, it's a website, what I'm connecting to. Uh, Epic uh, is the company that owns uh, one video game like Fortnite with 500 millions of users. So we're talking about interesting numbers uh, in terms of whatever you want to deliver to these people. There is a a commercial message, but also a cultural message, wh whatever you want to use and put in this channel. Here, as you've seen in Allegra's example, you can customize an avatar, uh, you can create your own, you can modify your outfit, uh, you can have uh, different kind of things. Let's remove the high glasses. Uh, then after doing all that, you can enter into a real virtual world. I don't like the word metaverse very much, even if I use it every day, because it's one of the more abused word in the last uh, years and a half, uh, year and a half, I would say. Before it was virtual reality and augmented reality that by the way, as probably you know, it's something that started in 1965. So 50 years ago, and then, went up and down, up and down. But the market is using this technology. So I don't want to go too far, but uh, just to show you that uh, what I'm doing here, uh, at the end, I say my character and I can move around in a real environment. I'm driving the, the avatar by myself in this moment. I can do many different things. I can enter in incredible spaces. Here I have um conference room i have uh, um a sort of cinema uh, there are spaces for uh doing training on uh, on um, on different kind of products it's a real world where i can even sit down now i'm alone because sometimes i find other people here inside uh but i can sit down for example here 
invite people to chat with me in a private chat, or I can have a public speech. Uh, it's a real, what we think about the metaverse world. Um, so, and trying to wrap up here, answering to your question, there is a huge interest on our side because we have developers, content creators, uh, and, and we do business with that. And that's a personal uh, love. I used to work with museums and cultural institutions from my last 25 years. And so sometimes we're also able to do business on that side. But uh, we think that in the future, also the government uh, in many different aspects will apply those kind of technologies because they are, they are there and everybody's using them. Yes, Franco, thank you so much, because actually that was, I wanted to stimulate, uh, uh, to, to, to bring in the, uh, our conversation, uh, some ideas, what well, exactly the future could be like in the cooperation between private and public, uh, and uh, uh, in developing tools, uh, uh, which are, you know, which could be at least a parallel reality, as we all seem to agree that hybrid Maybe the future, and I would like to get back to Ilan because there are many questions in the in the audience regarding to uh, the um, the global and the bilateral dimension of uh, uh, developing uh, cultural diplomacy, and uh, just ask to to Ilan to uh, maybe comment a little bit more about the fact that uh, uh, some some in the audience, for example, worry about. Uh, the uh, inability to penetrate within countries which refuse to allow contents to come in digitally uh, from other sources, say, uh, that they do, you know, that they, 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 they want to block, for example, or um, uh, say be more about the fact that uh, uh, international, um, I mean, organizations like the British Council, but also what would international organizations, can orga international organizations also pursue a kind of uh, global uh, 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 um, cultural uh, diplomacy? Uh, so, you know, if you, if you have a few more minutes to, to add up to what you had a chance to say in your presentation, Ilan, please. Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. So there's, there's a lot to, to uh, unpack here. Um, it, it's a very interesting question to ponder. Are we going to have kind of one global, you can call it metaverse, you can call it virtual reality, you can call it alternate reality, is it going to be one single unified world or is it going to be a fragmented world? We'll have a Western European metaverse, a Chinese metaverse, a Russian metaverse, et cetera. And each metaverse will have its own rules and its own uh, sanctions and its own rules about what can and cannot be done or said. I think there's also the corporate dimension here again, where we have one metaverse run by the company Meta and another metaverse run by Amazon and another metaverse run by a company who we don't even know yet. And we won't really have this global second uh, world that we're going to exist in. That's probably the reality, both because of uh, the way that the internet uh, has evolved in corporate terms and also the way that the world is going. So I would not be surprised if we would find ourselves with two or three or even four different metaverses. That's the first note. The second, it's interesting to think about international organizations. Some of them are already, I think, leading uh, the way in using digital technologies. For instance, the Red Cross has its own little metaverse where you can access its archives, you can access its library, you can access its historic records and look through the history of the organization. And that's an international organization. The UN is working on, on developing some kind of simulated reality. I think that we might be on the cusp of a very, very interesting era because what I, what I hear when I talk to diplomats more and more is that the imagination is starting to go wild. And what do I mean? It's great to do a metaverse where you can present art. That's an excellent way of getting art to more people. But imagine if you could have an immersive environment where you attend the Brussels ball, the famous ball before the war with Napoleon. Or imagine if you could have an immersive environment where you go and you actually witness Michelangelo painting the Sistine Chapel. Or you go and you visit Picasso's first ever exhibition. And it's a fully immersive environment where you travel back in time and you see people as they were uh, during Picasso's first exhibit. I think that's really fascinating prospect. And Cornelio touched a little bit about it when he talked about the Anne Frank House. 
by the idea of culture and history and the using this uh, metaverse, so using virtual reality as a way to make the past more accessible. And what's really important here if that is that if we have a shared past, we can also have a shared present and a shared future. Maybe we can bring people and countries together by showing our shared past and how much we actually share with one another. So those are just a few thoughts about where it might go in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ilan. Of course, you know, we, uh, um, we can immediately react, and I think I think uh, um, Cornelio has been um, uh, writing and saying a lot in this area of, of worrying also about if you go back in history. Naturally, I'm thinking of our conference in Brussels just a month ago. The narratives can be manipulated, so you know that is that risk. You know, so what is the risk? Some of the people in the chats are also uh, uh, asking the risk about security, and should we ramp up on uh, talking about as we are already over? time but maybe one minute uh, 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 we can still still uh, what do you think that is is, is is really high risk even if we keep the hybrid dimension of embracing the new technology is the risk getting higher uh, uh, compared to previous digital tools is anybody who wants to answer this Cornelia perhaps yeah well, I mean, the risk already with new technologies, you have to adapt to them. I have to, um, for instance, defense uh, structure in the United States, in UK, in Canada, and also in Europe, you, you've been using uh, synthetic environments, they call them synthetic environments, which is this kind of VR environments for military training, for engagement. And there is a lot of discussion about what extent they can be hacked. And then the entire training and the entire, you know, battlefield operation will, will collapse. Uh, so I think, you know, with the new technologies, I think it's it's always, but with the cultural, um, let's not forget, I mean, you, you pointed out, you know, the, the, the dark side, it's always there, and it's already present, in which, you know, the history is being rewritten, and the fact that the virtual reality, because of the presence, because of the interaction, becomes so real for many, it's, it's a different type of propaganda disinformation that you have to be aware of. Um, and the, the, the other point that in terms, I don't know whether it's a risk or not, I think there was a question in the audience about uh, this expansive field. You yes. have Ministry of Foreign Affairs with limited resources trying to do something. The private sector, I think, you know, it's, it's going to explode in this, but also, you know, it, it can bring in new actors. So the medium becomes more competitive um, for better or for worse. Uh, and the fact that it's so immersive, I think it can it can uh, have a deeper impact. We talk in, in VR theory about the Proteus effect. The Proteus effect is that the type of um, uh, elements, the behavior that you adopt, the way in which you uh, immerse yourself in the VR has repercussions for your offline behavior. So there is a lot of evidence about that and the way your persona, your virtual persona, the way in which you develop yourself has repercussion for your offline persona. So that type of interaction, it's another risk that you have to uh, to manage. Um, and uh, But we are at the beginning, I think, you know, with yes. this. Yes, yeah, so gonna thank you so much. And actually there has been, I mean, as you can see from the chat, there have been many comments that, uh, or, or questions that I, I have no time to pick up apart from uh, showing that actually there's been a great interest also for the, for the test case that has been presented here. Uh, by by Allegra and Franco, and many would like to know how you did it. Uh, I don't think we have time to explain that, uh, but I think the success of a of a webinar is uh, always uh, the fact that we we end with many more questions, and we will need much more time. So it means that uh, it's a discussion that is ongoing, and I would like so much to to uh, thank all four panelists for their contribution and their capacity to do it in a short time. And I uh, really hope there will be more opportunities to continue our conversation in other, uh, maybe in, in real presence uh, uh, in the future. So thank you so much to the organizers and uh, thank you so much to the audience for being with us.